So for today's prophecy update, I want to begin by clarifying a comment I made last week concerning the presidential election. I always do this to myself. And by the way, this is why I try to, in as much as I'm able, unless I really sense from the Holy Spirit to wander off, I always try to stay as close to my notes as possible. And I do this for a couple of reasons, one of which is that if I don't, I find myself repeating myself over and over again. I just keep repeating myself over and over again. I just keep repeating myself, just like that. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll be glad to know that <laughs> that uh, having notes uh, prevents me from doing that. So what was the comment I made? Well, I made this comment that I was conflicted about this year's unprecedented presidential election, so much so that I actually even asked for prayer as I sought the Lord. Now, I regret saying this because I didn't take the time to expound on exactly why it is that I was so conflicted. I wasn't conflicted about whether or not I was going to vote, nor was I conflicted about which candidate I would cast my vote. My wife and I are absolutely going to vote in spite of the fact that neither of us endorse either candidate. Now, I'm talking as a voter, not a pastor. And I want to say to you that I personally disapprove of both candidates, but it is still my duty to vote. It is certainly my privilege to vote. And to do so, I have to vote for the conservative platform. The platform more so than the person. Am I delineating between the two? Absolutely I am. I have to. And it's for this reason that we're voting for Trump. And I want you to think about this. Again, I'm a voter. I am an American. <laughs> so I'm going to vote. <laughs> All right. Very good. Very good. He is pro-life, he is pro-Israel, he is pro-Christian. By the way, his vice president, Mike Pence, a born-again Christian. You should know that. I hope you know that. And he's also pro-conservative Supreme Court, which if you've been following this election, you understand the significance and the importance of the Supreme Court. This is the likes of which we've never seen in our lifetime, in our lifetime. Last week, I was in contact with Jack Hibbs. He's the pastor of Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills in California. Uh, also, Amir Sarfati, who we had here, and uh, Jan Markell. Uh, Jan Markell is going to be doing a radio program on the election. She's interviewing a number of people, of which I am one, and the program will air on the weekend broadcast prior to the election, so it'll be the weekend of Saturday, November 5th, and Sunday, November 6th. Spent some time with her on the phone, and by the way, this is probably as good of a time as any to mention that Jan is already planning next year's conference. It'll be on October 7th, and I will have the honor of being one of the speakers along with Mark Hitchcock, who some of you will remember we also had uh, here a number of years ago. Jack Hibbs will be one of the uh, speakers. Amir Sarafati will be one of the speakers, and possibly Michelle Bachman as well. Also, I should probably mention that, uh, and this is sort of an announcement in advance, especially for our online people, uh, I'm going to be gone in October of next year, if we're still here, of course. We could, could all be gone <laughs> by October of next year. So, but. Um, I'm going to be one of the speakers at the Prophecy Watchers Conference the following week, which is October 13th through the 15th, and that'll be in Norman, Oklahoma. So I'm thinking about just kind of not being here for the whole month of October. Hope you don't mind. Uh, if you do, oh well. <laughs> so, sorry, you have plenty of advance notice, okay? You just have to come to the conferences. Okay, that said... Why was I conflicted? Well, the reason I was so conflicted and concerned 
is because of what I see as the proverbial handwriting on the wall. And I'll explain what I mean by that. On November 9th, the day after the election, I am concerned and I fear that history will repeat itself regardless of who the president is. If Clinton wins, I fear that Christians will give in to hopelessness. And if Trump wins, I fear that Christians will be too hopeful such that they place their hope in the newly elected president to make America great again. Now I've shared in the past that I do not see an America great again as being compatible with what my Bible says the world will be like at the time of the end. So that doesn't mean that he doesn't become the president, but it also doesn't mean that if he becomes the president that the Lord's return is further off. I will say this, and I got to be careful because this isn't in my notes either, and <laughs> I'll only say it once, I won't repeat myself. But whether it's Clinton or Trump as the president, I am so convinced that our redemption draws so nigh. And like Paul writing to the Romans in chapter 13, he said, our salvation draws nearer than when we first believed. The night is almost over. It's time to wake up from your slumber. Now, I'll take it just a little bit further and we'll move on here. Um, if Clinton is elected president, then barring the Lord's return and the rapture of the church, it is going to become increasingly difficult for born-again Christians in terms of specifically religious freedom. I'm, I'm telling you that now. And, and you should know that. You should know what the platforms are. You should know where they stand on the issues that matter to you and that matter to me. And I will tell you that if she is elected president, it's going to be really bad for the Christian church in America. Now, one of the things that Jen and I were talking about on the phone this last week was that that might be exactly what needs to happen. And you'll forgive me. But I've said it before, I'll say it again. You want to grow the church? Persecute the church. You want to grow the church? Persecute the church. Now, I know some of you are squirming in your seats. But think about it. When it's too comfortable for Christians in the world, that's the most dangerous thing. We often wonder about our brothers and sisters in the Middle East and how they are standing firm in the face of unspeakable persecution and martyrdom. And you wonder how they do it? Well, we probably wonder how they're able to do that because that is so foreign to us. We've had it too good for too long. And so maybe that's what needs to happen? That that's what it takes for people to wake up from their slumber? This concern that I have about Christians giving in to hopelessness or maybe placing too much hope is that our hopefulness and or our hopelessness should never be predicated upon who becomes the president. Our hope is in Jesus Christ and the soon return of Jesus Christ in the pre-tribulation rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. If things are too good down here, you don't want to leave, right? I got to share this. It's been a while, so my senior year in high school, 
I wasn't saved, so don't cast stones at me, okay? I was so rebellious. I was a, a druggie. I was a drinker, a partier, just a... God saved me from that, but, and I praise the Lord for that. I'm not proud of it. My senior year in high school, I got suspended, and I got threatened that I would be expelled and not graduate. And that was a problem because my dad was a, a teacher in that school. I was a teacher's kid, and that was part of the problem for me. You know, So <laughs> I have a, a great compassion for my kids who are pastor's kids. I think that's worse than being a teacher's kid. And I had a... Uh, one of the teachers take me aside one day and not a Christian and she spoke these words to me that were so prophetic I didn't know it at the time but she basically said to me this you know how it is that some people never ever grow past their high school days those were the glory days they always live in the past you know you know who they are you know who you are you still got your class ring it's okay it's all right Still got your letterman's jacket. It doesn't fit, but you still got it, man. <laughs> they don't want to leave. And truth be known, they don't really want to graduate either. I couldn't wait to graduate. I couldn't wait to graduate. In fact, you know, this is true. And again, I'm not proud of it. One of the models, you know how they have the, the senior class motto? You know, there's always a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You know, those kind of things. You know what mine was? I've come out of my coma to receive my diploma. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of how bad it was, okay? I couldn't wait to get out of there. I was counting the days down. I wanted to get out of school. Why? Because I didn't like it there. Now think about that. You know, when you talk to some Christians, are you, like me, shocked to find that they're not excited about the rapture? Have you ever asked yourself why? Could it be that they like it too much down here? This teacher said to me the following. She said, if it was like that for you, you wouldn't want to graduate. But the fact that you don't like it here, and it's not been comfortable for you here, and good for you here, you know, because all of the other teachers are going, man, you're Mr. Frog's son. You should know better than that. Ooh, that was the worst thing you could ever say. I hated that. I wasn't saved. Remember now, I wasn't saved. And I thought about it years later when I got saved. That's how it is for this world. If I really am comfortable in this world, no hurry, no worry. But isn't it true when things go badly and adversity strikes, you want the Lord to come back yesterday, right? That's how it is. The more difficult it is down here, the more I'm going to want what awaits me up there. And that to me is the why behind the what. And that's what my hope is in. That's what my hope is in. Now, this hope does not mean that I'm excused as a Christian from voting. Nor does it mean that Christians should write in Jesus when they're voting. No, I'm serious. Don't do that. <laughs> Come on, man. I, it's, it's cute, okay, but come on, all right? His kingdom is, is not of this world. Perhaps you'll indulge me for just a bit. I want to draw your attention to a must-read, and I mean a must-read town hall article written by Wayne Grudem titled, If You Don't Like Either Candidate, Then Vote for Trump's Policies. I share the following excerpts with the hope that doing so will be helpful. Here's some of what he wrote. After I saw the shocking 2005 video with Trump talking about his sexual aggression against women, I wrote, there is no morally good presidential candidate in this election. 
I condemned Trump's immoral conduct, and I said I did not know how I would vote. I asked townhall.com to remove my earlier article, Why Voting for Donald Trump is a Morally Good Choice. I urged Trump to withdraw, hoping we could get a better candidate. The liberal media loved it. He goes on to write, Evangelical theologian calls on Trump to withdraw. I suddenly had more requests for interviews from mainstream news organizations than ever in my lifetime. And this is a prolific writer, evangelical Christian. I turned them all down, and Trump did not withdraw. Now, how should I vote? Voting for Clinton and her ultra-liberal policies is not an option for me as an evangelical Christian. Therefore, I am left with two options. One, vote for Trump. Or two, vote for a third-party candidate whose hopes of winning belong to fantasy, not reality. And if these are my only two options, then voting for a third-party candidate has the clear effect of helping to elect Clinton because it is taking my vote away from Trump. This is why the liberal media loved it when I said I was finding it hard to decide. It also means that my two options are actually this. One, vote for Trump, or two, help Hillary Clinton get elected. Once I put the choice in those stark terms, there is a good way to make a decision. Since I find both candidates morally objectionable, I am back to the old-fashioned basis on which I have usually decided how to vote for my entire life, whose policies are better whose policies are better? Do I agree more with Trump's policies or with Clinton's? It isn't even close. I overwhelmingly support Trump's policies and believe that Clinton's policies will seriously damage the nation, perhaps forever. On the Supreme Court, Abortion, religious liberty, sexual orientation regulations, taxes, economic growth, the minimum wage, school choice, Obamacare, protection from terrorists, immigration, the military, energy, and safety in our cities. I think Trump is far better than Clinton. Again and again, Trump supports the policies I advocated in my 2010 book, Politics According to the Bible. Excellent book, by the way. Several Christian friends, he goes on to write, tell me they still have some moral objections to voting for Trump. Here is why I'm not persuaded by their objections. And he goes on at length to answer very well the following objections. In the interest of time, I'll just read the objections that he answers brilliantly and beautifully. Number one, my conscience won't let me vote for Trump. He answers that. Number two, voting for Trump means you approve of his immoral treatment of women. Number three, when faced with the lesser of two evils, choose neither one. He answers that. Number four, if you vote for Trump, you'll never have credibility in the future when you say that character matters. Number five, we have to send the Republican Party a message that a candidate like Trump is unacceptable. Really? Have you seen what the Republican Party has done as of late? Number six, it is wrong for Christians to place their trust in a morally compromised man, and we just talked about that. Number seven, I could never tell my friends that I voted for Trump. I think they need to go back and listen to the Second Corinthians teaching about Self-love, self-preservation, having your pride wounded. <laughs> Number eight, we should vote for neither one and trust a sovereign God to bring about his good purposes for the nation. This is an interesting one. I love how he masterfully handles it. Let me just say this. You've heard it said, trust God, but lock your car. <laughs> really? Well, it's rigged. This is my own, not, not his. The, the election is rigged. C forgive me. Can I just ask you a question? Do you think that God doesn't know that? 
Do, do you think that God won't have the final, my vote won't matter, it's all rigged, it's all a setup? Really? Can you imagine if that were really the case? And it could. We've already seen some WikiLeaks <laughs> uh, emails about how that they totally rigged everything and hired people, paid them money to go start violent riots at Trump's campaign rallies. Wow, how's that one? So yeah, okay, let's say it's rigged. Can you imagine Almighty God in heaven, God who created the heavens and the earth and the sea and all that in them is, in the heavenlies on Tuesday, November 8th, going, what are we going to do? They rigged the thing, man! Gabriel, Michael, get over here! What are we going to do? <laughs> Whoever's president on November 9th, doesn't matter, because God will have the final word. And God is still on the throne. And I'm not, I'm not afraid. I'm not fearful. I'm not worried. Number nine, are there no limits to what you will tolerate in a candidate? Number 10, my vote doesn't really matter. I don't even live in a battleground state. That could be said of us here in Hawaii, right? <laughs> I mean, not, not just that, but the time zone. It's already been decided by the time our polls close. Really? I, in Washington State, it wasn't quite as bad. And then when I moved here to Hawaii, it was like, wow, this is terrible. They got to do something about this. I don't know what. Maybe we can just get up five hours earlier or something and vote. And number 11, lastly, I can't trust Trump to do what he promises. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anyway, he, he, he deals with these masterfully. He refutes all of these objections from Christians. And then Grudem concludes with a thorough explanation of the contrast between both candidates concerning the Supreme Court. This is just a few. The Supreme Court, Israel, Iran, Russia, abortion, religious liberty, Christian business owners, Christian schools and colleges, churches, freedom of speech, the military, school choice, and criminalizing dissent, as well as many other issues facing Americans today. Suffice it to say, the two candidates have virtually polar opposite positions as it relates to the future of this once most powerful and blessed nation on earth. I've never seen anything like it in my lifetime. And by the way, when you hear someone say this is the most important election of our lifetime, that's an understatement. That's an understatement. And it's not just the most important election for the United States of America. Make no mistake about it. It's the most important election for the entire world. And the whole world is watching it. The whole world is watching our election. I'm sorry if I'm yelling. I, I won't yell. I believe that this year's presidential election has profound prophetic implications, not just for America, but the entire world, specifically concerning Israel, Russia, and Iran. And it's evidenced by two Jerusalem Post articles from yesterday, both of which speak to this from Israel's perspective. The first of which is about how America's foreign policy is turning Iran, Ezekiel 38's Iran, into a world power. Let me quote the Post. The next American president will determine if Iran becomes the dominant power in the region and if it will also become a nuclear power. Most of the Israeli media coverage of the U.S. presidential election has relied on a translation of the completely biased American media and focuses on matters that are irrelevant for Israel. If I were an American citizen, Perhaps I would be worried about Donald Trump's treatment of women, but as an Israeli, I ask myself, <laughs> which American president would I prefer stand before Iran? Listen to this. <laughs> I like this. One can imagine, as president, Hillary Clinton would condemn 
with harsh words, Iran's first nuclear test. You'll forgive my cynicism. I can also imagine how Trump, as president, would inform Iran <laughs> that if he dares to develop a nuclear bomb, it will make the acquaintance of the American arsenal of weapons. Yes! And this is, listen to this, the Iranians also believe that he's crazy enough to follow through with the threat. I like that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Be afraid. Very afraid. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that, that's a sanctified, uh, you know. <laughs> His contribution to world history could be far more important than the testimony of the harassed women who are dominating the American airwaves today. I am not certain that the last word in these elections has been heard. And I want you to listen very carefully to what they say next. The battle that is taking place now far from Washington in the northern Iraqi city of Mosul is liable to motivate ISIS supporters in the U.S. and Europe to act in the coming days. I hope not. And a big terror attack can have a serious influence on election results. That would be a game changer. That would be a game changer. That was concerning Iran. This article is concerning Russia. Well, it seems that there's now the return of the Cold War, and this is what it is from Israel's perspective. Again, quoting the Post. Judging by recent week's events, a second Cold War is underway. The great schism that haunted the post-war international system is staging an improbable return albeit with different motivations, aims, tactics, and also an entirely different Israeli role. With Russia's warplanes slaughtering Syrians, Isaiah 17, reducing Aleppo, very key. By the way, Russia's there. It's all about oil and gas. He's all about protecting his interests. That's why he's there. He's not there because he loves Syria or even Bashar al-Assad. He's there to protect his interests in Syria. Reducing Aleppo to rubble and making a mockery of a ceasefire signed with the U.S. and with Washington, listen to this, threatening new sanctions while accusing Moscow of cyber attacking America's political process. Oh, just breaking this morning. Russia isn't doing it. Guess who is? I'll let you guess. And they're threatening each other? Russia went to the attic and retrieved the first Cold War's rhetoric. Meanwhile, as Russian aircraft carrier Kuznetsov headed from Norway to Syria, Vice President Joe Biden <laughs> threatened Russia with a cyber attack. Oh, really? Quote, their capacity to fundamentally alter the U.S. presidential election is not what people think, he said on NBC's Meet the Press, but then warned that to the extent that they do, we will be proportional in what we do. Them are fighting words. This is uh, what Jesus said, wars and threats of wars. Wars and threats of wars. Rumors of wars. It's exactly what we see happening now. And by the way, with Putin, it's not proportional. He's already said in no uncertain terms, made it very clear, that it will be asymmetrical. It'll be asymmetrical. It will be disproportionate. In other words, you threaten us with that, we'll come at you with all of the guns blazing, and we'll hold nothing back. We'll hold nothing back. Well, okay. I need to take a deep breath here. <laughs> As I was seeking the Lord this last week, He ministered to me, as He's always so faithful to, 
that everything we see happening in the world today is a spiritual war for the souls of men. From the U.S. presidential election to what we see taking place in Syria with the Islamic State, with Russia, Iran, it's a war in the spiritual realm for the souls of men. For me, it's a much needed reminder of how our battle is not against flesh and blood. Our battle is not against Republican or Democrat, Trump or Clinton, Muslim or unbeliever, Sunni Muslim or Shia Muslim. The battle is not against flesh and blood. Kindly allow me to read Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13. The Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Ephesus, says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And here's why. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but, and he's going to list four entities. Number one, we wrestle against principalities. Number two, we wrestle against powers. And number three, we wrestle against the rulers of the darkness of this age. And number four, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. What do we do about it? We always say the battle belongs to the Lord. Well, it does. But we are to, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and it is an evil day. And having done all to stand, and he goes metaphorically through the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith. Did I miss one? Maybe I did. What did I miss? The sword of the Spirit. Oh, God. Oh, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Oh, my goodness. I'm still saved. I forgot the sword of the Spirit. I'm so sorry. Oh, oh my goodness. My poor brain, my memory. It's so bad. I have to remind myself of that because I, I am very prone to get caught up in the battle, that's the wrong battle. And I'm fighting it in the wrong realm. On Thursday night, I talked about how Muslims, by the multitudes, are coming to Christ. The Muslim is not our enemy. Islam is the enemy, but the Muslim is not our enemy. God loves the Muslims. And on Thursday night, I was talking about how the Muslims, by the multitudes, are coming to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And what I want to do in closing is share with you a testimony, a praise report from one of our missionaries about one such Muslim whose identity we have to protect. He says, I happen to be a Muslim preacher. I have never killed anybody, but I supported the jihad movement through preaching and encouraging those who go to the war front. Something occurred that changed my thinking forever. One night I left the mosque to go to bed when from nowhere a little child of about eight years stopped me and asked this question. Preacher, teacher, my Christian friend in school told me that Jesus told them that he is the life, the truth, and the way, and that no one will go to God except through him. Is it true? And what similar promise did our prophet told us? From that day onward, I never set my eyes on that boy, and I never had a good sleep either. <laughs> I kept seeing that boy in a dream, and sometimes in reality in the form of a spirit. I tried to look for the answer for one year now, from the Qur'an to the Hadiths, to no avail, and this question never want to leave my mind. I consulted many other Muslim scholars as to whether this, there is a verse which our Prophet was able to, to guarantee us eternity. There is none. So, sir, after one year, this same boy appeared to me raw and simply gave me a paper 
and on it was written John 1.1 1, 1, and nothing else. When I show it to a colleague cleric, he simply said, it is an ordinary Christian flyer printout. To my conscience and judging from what happened exactly one year, this one phrase, white paper, is equal to the one life I have, and I decided to look for Jesus to unravel the mystery of the question of leading me to God. Please, this is my life. And what I preached in Islam, and the pains I caused to innocent lives, I deeply regret it. I'm so sorry for being a Muslim for all my life. I pray with you the prayer you gave me am in tears and can't write, please, I need forgiveness, we'll write later. Our missionary sent a few more emails to him, shared the gospel, told him about God's gift of forgiveness, wrote to him the words of Jesus himself, and here is his email response. I am so sorry for some silence. I was trying to escape assassination attempts on me and my family. There is no time to have a proper thinking than that of running and hiding from my assassins. Please, please pray for us to the Lord to save us from the hands of the jihadists chasing us and the police are doing nothing to protect us. Do we have no right to practice our religion of choice? Please pray for us, especially my little children. As they do not deserve this horror. I deserved it. It is my decision to follow Christ, come what may. I will write back if I am still alive. But if they succeeded in getting me, we meet in heaven. Where there will be justice. Thank you, brother, your brother in Christ. Well... A couple days went by and then he did write back and here's what he had to say. I trust in your God and my new God for he is a loving God. Unlike Allah, unlike Allah God, who when I was following him said we should kill to defend him. I am trusting my new God for he promised me life after death unlike Allah who said in hadith, Sayyidna Ali, that he has no idea about what befall him on the judgment day. That's Muhammad. I will triumph over the jihadists trying to take vengeance for their weak God, Allah. This was a, a Muslim preacher. I will see myself in the company of the faithful ones in heaven. Please keep praying for us here in the wilderness. Thank you, brother. Ah, oh, is that humbling? Is that not humbling? I implore you, if you're here today, and you are uncertain, there's some uncertainty, any uncertainty as to whether or not you would go to be the Lord when you die. If that's a question mark, it doesn't have to be. John said, you can know that you have eternal life. How? Jesus said, if you're born again, you will see the kingdom of heaven. How do I be born again? Romans 10, 13 says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you've never called upon the name of the Lord, I implore you today. I'm, I'm begging you. Maybe you're watching online from the Middle East and you heard this testimony from your former Muslim brother. And you too want to know the true and living God. Not the Allah God, but the true and living God. I implore you today to call upon him as your brother has counting the cost come what may in jesus name why don't you stand and we'll pray loving heavenly father i thank you so much for what you're doing in the middle east I thank you so much for revealing yourself 
to these multitudes of Muslims who are searching, who are so lost, so deceived, and need you. And whether it's the Middle East, so far away, or right here today, for anyone, Lord, that has not yet called upon you, open their heart to you to be saved. I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.